Welcome to Data Byte number 154, The Trauma of Cast and Tech. I'm Tuniko Nikikami, Assistant Producer at Data and Society. Today's conversation is hosted and moderated by Sarita Amrute, Principal Researcher at Data and Society and Associate Professor of Strategic Design at Parsons, the new school, and is supported by the events team, myself and Senior Producer Rigoberto Lara Guzman. For those joining us for the first time, Data and Society is an independent research institute studying the social implications of data and automation. We produce original research and regularly convene multidisciplinary thinkers to challenge the power and purpose of technology in society. Data and Society began in New York City, an island node in a large network of hills, rivers, and mountains in the Atlantic Northeast, known as Lenape Hoking, homeland of the Lenape diaspora, and a historical gathering site for many Native peoples. Since the pandemic, we left our Manhattan office and have been connecting online via a different network, a vast array of servers, cables, and computer devices. In the United States, much of this infrastructure sits on stolen land acquired under the extractive logic of white settler expansion. As an organization, we acknowledge this history and uplift the sovereignty of indigenous people, data, and territory around the planet. I'm happy to hand off to our host and join you all in listening to what will absolutely be an engaging and dynamic conversation. Thank you so much, Tunika. I am so excited today to welcome our guest, Tainmun Muri Sundararajan, a Dalit American artist, community organizer, technologist, and theorist. Currently, Tain Muri is executive director of Equality Labs, which she co-founded. And she's the author of The Trauma of Caste, a Dalit Feminist Meditation on Survivorship, Healing, and Abolition. Her debut nonfiction is the focus of today's conversation. I have my copy of The Trauma of Caste here with me, and you can get your own copy at our affiliate link, which will be posted in the chat. I also wanted to say a quick thank you to everyone who opted into our book raffle during registration. The raffle winners will receive an email in the coming few days requesting their mailing addresses to receive their copy of The Trauma of Cast. We appreciate you turning in today to learn about Tain Mori's critical and urgent work. Please start thinking about your questions and post them in the Q&A section throughout the event. And feel free to leave comments about what comes up for you in the chat. I'd like to start today by offering my profound thanks to Thane Mori for writing this absolutely beautiful book. It's been a pleasure to read. Um, to preview it a little bit for everyone in the audience, Thane Mori takes us through both personal and deeply well theorized and thought out uh, discussions of the relationship between caste and the world that we live in. And specifically for our data and society audience, she has a lot to say about the relationship between caste as a structure of oppression and tech worlds. Um, but I wanted to start, Dean Murray, by asking you to tell us a little bit about why you wrote this book. What sparked your interest in, in writing this piece? And why did you choose a book forum to express yourself in? Thank you, Sarita, for that question. And hello to everyone that's joining us. So for me, I think that I really, you know, approach this book from, you know, a place I think of despair, you know, and I'm not sure how people were feeling, you know, right at the end of 2019, 2020, but it was pretty rough, I think, for, for me as an organizer and as a theorist and as a person, you know, as we headed into the pandemic, I was really struck by the endless cycles of polarization and violence that really kind of plagues so much of our democratic discourse. And, you know, in the issue that I work a lot in, which is the issue of caste, um, I kept seeing these cycles of violence. And, you know, after 15 years of doing this work, you know, it's not, it, it's something that just was tremendous, I think, on my heart and really weighed heavy there. And as we entered into, you know, the last year of the Trump administration and into the pandemic, um, I would talk with elders who were civil rights activists who had spent 60 years of their lives getting these wins, like affirmative action and uh, the right to choose. And they were watching all of their rights erode right in front of their eyes. 
So I felt like we needed to approach things differently. And I thought that um, if, if instead of just kind of being a rapid responder, being a firefighter, I wanted to just slow stuff down and see what would be different if I kind of went from the inside out started with the body and the nervous system to then kind of look outward um, into what helps contributes to cycles of violence. And I think as that was happening, we had these big, massive world issues that happened, you know, like in 2019, you know, the Indian government launched one of the largest genocidal projects in world history. You know, we went from that into a pandemic, into an uprising, <laughs> into a coup, and that only gets us to 2021, right? So we know that we're in a time of deep instability and, and that really requires us to think differently. And so that was, one of the core reasons why I wrote this book, as well as my mom became terminal. You know, she, um, her kidneys failed. And as I watched her fight for her life, it made me think about why, why do, you know, so many BIPOC bodies struggle under the burdens of racial and caste and gender stress? And are there different ways that we can approach these systems of violence um, where we're not just fighting them and resisting them, but that we can heal from them? And so I employed a lot of different modalities. You know, you see my you see my mind as a as a theorist. You see my mind as a Buddhist. You see my mind as a feminist. You see my mind as a survivor, but you also see my mind as a daughter, and um, and as someone who's part of a continuity with the earth and with the species. Yeah, and one thing, and and what you're saying is, you mentioned that you wanted to slow down. And as I was reading the book, what I found really remarkable is how well you are able to address different audiences through this body of work. And just to read a little bit from your author's note at the beginning, you, you started by saying, I write this book for my parents. And then each paragraph tells us another audience that the book is addressing. I write for my ancestors. I write this in honor of the Dalit, Bahujan, and Adivasi thinkers, reformers, and leaders. I write this book for the 54 million South Asian Americans who live in the US. I write this book because progressive Americans of all ethnicities and faiths need to know that justice and dignity and liberation are not just issues at home, but how do we build solidarity across nations? And it goes on, it talks about Muslim brethren climate brethren, kin in various forms, in solidarity with Black liberation. And I was wondering if you could talk to us a little bit about you know, who you wrote the book for, um, whether it's, it's for all these groups equally, or is it for them in different ways? How did you approach that question of audience? Well, it was very interesting because I think the first audience I wrote this book for was actually myself. Mm -hmm. and, you know, I think if you are someone who is um, <clears throat> from a community that is oppressed, I think one of the things that we learned very early on is how to comp compartmentalize all of our identities mm -hmm. and also how to compartmentalize the pain that comes from uh, those systems of oppression. And so, you know, as an organizer, I have my feet in all of these different movements because caste operates in all these different domains. And from a logical level, like I can go toe to toe with anyone to talk about, you know, what, you know, how does caste operate? How do we deal with it as in, in this institution? However, when I think, when I began to write this book, I hadn't really done the reckoning of what caste had done to me in mm -hmm. my body in my heart, in my spirit. And, you know, violence breaks so much of your consciousness and to kind of do that slow work of integration so that you can see it, you know, for all of the pieces that your heart has been broken into, that's why I wrote it, you know? And even I was surprised, like in writing a book like this, you, you would think like, okay, you worked on this for 15 years, you know everything you need to know. But in fact, the integration teaches you an even meta level of understanding of how a system like this operates. So for me, in the integration, I could see then the pathways that all of these different, you know, beloved communities that I've built all along um, could then be able to find integration within the larger whole. Because Dalit, Bahujan, and Adivasi movements are siloed from so many other racial and gender justice movements. 
folks that are survivors are often sidelined in their organizations and movements. And rarely do we see that assertion of their power be integrated back into their institution. So in many ways, the healing that I was talking about was also about the weaving back of people that have been put into the margins and centering us back where we are actually the majority and can also see ourselves in a full way. But I couldn't do that unless I did that work for myself, which is, you know, what was so powerful me, to me and also very unexpected. You know, because I think when you go in with a theorist's mind, you're not going in with like a healer's mind, right? Mm -hmm. Because for theoretical work, you're, you're just there to be like, this is the problem. And it's like brute force, let me strip it down to all of its form. But by the time you finish, there's not necessarily a, a framework that then says, and how do we heal? How do we build? That's for another journey. And I tried to do both because I think it's very unsatisfying to present a violent system like this and not provide pathways of how to turn pain into power. Mm. Yeah, that's extremely exciting to hear. And it kind of leads me to another question, which is, you know, it was interesting for me to hear that some of the work on integrating your own story of caste into the, the theoretical or movement building work that you've been doing for 15 years was surprising to you. And for readers, just, just to preview a little bit, Thane Mori tells us about how in, in her own family, in fact, caste was something that wasn't really talked about. It was a hidden secret, um, both on her mother's side and her father's side, um, as she mentions in the book, they come to the US and uh, they in fact mask their caste identity so as not to be out ostracized within their communities. And it's, I won't give it away because you should all read the book, but it's through a series of events in Thane Mori and her sister's childhood and then again in college that the real understanding about how traumatic that um, that passing can be um, and how traumatic the history of being told that uh, essentially as a, as a group through biology, you have, you've been dehumanized, how traumatic that can be. Um, and what I wanted to ask you about is when you go back and revisit the book now, if you read it out loud to somebody or you hear it, you hear it being out, read out loud in a book talk, what are some of the things that surprise you, continue to surprise you about it? You know, I think that a book like this has a very unusual life uh, in the hearts and the minds of its readers. And I think I'm just discovering that because I think that it is, it is, it is like an odd book. You know, it is both a theoretical book and a book about healing. And it has workshops and meditations as well as personal stories, but also very hard data, you know, that's not found anywhere about caste in the, uh, in the diaspora across many industries, including tech. However, I think that um, for me, the thing I was so surprised by was the overwhelming flow of emotion. I had readers who would like DM me or share photos where they would talk about their attempts at suicide or would talk about the grief that they had and they never had words or a container for. I had other people who told me about the breakthroughs they had with their families because they read the book and then they would read it with their parents because now they had a way to talk about caste and understand what kind of historical violence they had gone through. Um, and then I also had people who shared with me that um, they were able to come out for the first time as cast depressed after they read it. And so I think that I just hadn't expected um, the incredible flow of emotion because I put all that emotion in the book. And I think, you know, you know, as an author, you don't really think about, you think of the finish line first as like, let me just get the book into the publisher. You forget there's a whole other side of your book um, life that has to do with now how people make it their own, mm -hmm. their journey of freedom. Mm -hmm. And um, and I think I feel very humbled by that because as I wrote this book, I realized it was something that was much larger than I could have anticipated because I knew even me, I surrendered in writing this book. I, you know, mm -hmm. there are words in there that just came from my spirit that sometimes I look back to it and I'm like, I did that. I wrote that. Mm -hmm. it's really shocking because it's it's like getting to these like very painful truths that we rarely get to talk about with cast and to see it so precisely laid out 
it just is a very much an opening in the heart. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I want to talk a little bit later, if we can, about some of your healing methodologies, especially the RAIN methodology. But maybe before we go there, it would be worth it to move a little bit into the logical register and for our audiences, talk about why caste matters to tech and tech worlds in particular. And, you know, you've done so much work on this in your activism, but for our audience, how does tech work through caste in the U.S. and, and transnationally? Well, I think what's really important, especially for folks that are learning about caste for the first time, you know, it is a system of exclusion. It has its origin in two, you know, from 2000 years ago in Hindu scripture, but it's now found in every community of practice and it impacts over 1.9 billion people. And, you know, like race, it's based on a social fiction. There's a caste at the top called the Brahmin or the priestly caste um, that set up this division in society that certain castes are defined a certain level of spiritual purity and therefore have different jobs that they're assigned. So under the Brahmins, you have the Kshatriyas who are the rulers, the Vaishyas who are the merchants, the Shudras who are the peasants. And then outside of that whole kind of caste pyramid, there's a group of people that are seen spiritually defiling. They are spiritual criminals for crimes that they did in a past life and therefore sentenced to be untouchable in this life. And, you know, of course, that's an epithet. We don't like that word. And, you know, for those people who are from that community, like myself, we use the term Dalit, caste depressed, or even identify as a different religion or identity just to escape it. And, and I think, you know, like every major system of exclusion, caste has its interpersonal, individual, and structural manifestations. And it's the structural pieces of caste where we see power, you know, consolidated at the top of that caste pyramid with, you know, dominant caste people that we really want to concern ourselves with when we see the reorganization of power in tech, tech companies around uh, biases of caste and race. And, and I think one of the reasons why tech is so su susceptible to caste is because any industry that has a large amount of South Asians is going to see caste manifest in their institutions. And in the work of my organization, Equality Labs, like we conducted one of the first surveys to document caste in the United States. And we found that one in four caste depressed people faced physical or verbal assault, one out of three educational discrimination, and two out of three workplace discrimination, and that's in the United States. So with tech, what we've seen is that the talent pipelines, especially talent pipelines that recruit out of India, where there is deep casteism in the universities, um, leads to a process of departments and staffing and workplaces that also see, also see replications of casteism across the board. And I always think of caste as kind of impacting many verticals in a tech company. You know, it creates casteist workplaces, and then casteist workplaces create casteist products. And, um, and so there's a lot of work to be done to really examine um, how um, bias is impacting, you know, millions of people who may come from caste depressed backgrounds. So for me, I think it's a very, very large conversation. There needs to be more work around this. And of course, Data and Society has uh, been supporting some of these conversations. And, um, and I think that the, the really powerful thing to kind of recognize is that uh, we know that this significant discrimination is happening, so much so that the state of California sued the first corporation in the United States, Cisco Corporation, for a castus hostile workplace. And, um, and the things that people saw was like open usage of slurs in the workplace, people getting sexual, sexually harassed, uh, people facing, you know, siloing in their work, demotions, being passed over for promotions, and even being fired and terminated. So you don't have to be an expert in caste to know that significant discrimination is occurring. And I think that in regions where caste is very uh, prominent, we also have concerns with how dominant caste power might also collide 
with the development of digital authoritarianism, especially in um, democracies that are in crisis or facing religious ethno-nationalism. So just like we would not look at US tech without talking about racial bias, we have to understand that you know, our multinational corporations have transnational global workforces. The model of race that we're using, which is one that's primarily informed from a North American context, really occludes us from understanding global hegemonic systems like caste. And HR is not prepared to deal with it. There's actually not enough um, you know, research tools to also help people you know, to understand how caste bias, uh, bias may inform user experience and the product use you know, for users around the world. And this is why we got to talk about it. Yeah, and in addition to our, or maybe to re-emphasize what you're saying, one of a really the strong points in the book for me in, in this mode is really the way you make the link between conditions within the labor force and then the kinds of business product decisions that are made inside the tech companies. And there's a quote that we've talked about um, in the past, but I just wanted to read it again from the book, which is... Um, which is this one around who is actually going to be held accountable for, for some of these occlusions, right? And you write, there's more to be done to hold these corporations accountable. The instinct for us to connect as a species is noble, but should our connections be defined by people like the founders of Facebook who sat in a Harvard dorm room trying to get hot chicks? I don't think so. That's not the competency that's required for platforms that have become integral for democracy. And so I think, you know, maybe one of the things that you're pointing out there is that without, if we don't deal with uh, a the way that the system of oppression that is caste oppression manifests itself in tech industries, we're going to continue to see large scale genocides. We're going to continue to see platforms that spread messages of hate and divisiveness because in fact, the people who helm these platforms are, they don't have the kind of competency that they would need and perhaps they don't want to acquire it um, to really face these problems head on. And I, I think that's so important, Sarita, for people to really understand is that that whole model that came out of Silicon Valley about moving fast and breaking things really, you know, meant it also broke our democracies all around the world. And I think from my vantage point, I was one of the first advocates and researchers that worked with the companies on the issue of caste. So I saw <clears throat> with my own eyes how inept each of these companies were in handling the moderations of hundreds of millions of people in, <clears throat> in the South Asian market. And also for them, policy meant only the US market because they were really catering to US civil rights groups that they were much more worried about because they could lead to regulation in the country through Congress. Then they really didn't care at all what was happening to their largest market that was growing, uh, the Indian market at this time. But I think through our advocacy, through our research and continuous kind of pressure on the inside, we were able to get cast as a protected category in terms of moderation at YouTube and at Facebook and at Twitter. But it was already too late by the time we did that because they'd already been in operation for five to six years. And the bias in the staff and the lack of cultural competency meant so much dangerous speech that was casteist, that was Islamophobic, and that targeted religious minorities had already become the norm. Mm -hmm. And that's the danger. Again, this is why I keep saying bias companies create biased products. And it's why we need to have a global understanding of these systems of oppression around the technology that we use and that we study, because we don't want to be documenting our own demise, you know, which is often what I feel like we're doing because of how, um, how reckless these companies are in, you know, holding up their duty of care to their users and the democracies that they operate in. Yeah, and staying on that theme for a little bit about not wanting to document demise, right? Um, with your with your Dalit feminist act, activist hat on still, where do you think DEIA movements within companies need to go next? Um, what do they need to do to better address 
the harms of caste, but also questions of indigeneity, anti-Blackness, all of those big issues that are, are on the table in tech firms. Well, I think that <clears throat> the remarkable thing about these companies is that they're not monoliths. And many of the workers inside join these companies because they want to make the world a better place. And they are running campaigns to, you know, all the time to make these workplaces better. And one simple thing companies could do would be to listen to their workers. Add cast as a protected category. Think about ways that they are contributing to settler colonialism and um, and really incorporate the, the, the issues and the concerns of the people that are helping them make the money that they want. Because people aren't there just to, to turn a buck. They're there to build infrastructure for the world. And many workers, and Sarita, you and I know uh, many people in common, um, they, they, they're here to make the world a better place. They wanted to listen to the mission of places like Google that said do no evil when they first joined and actually saw that maybe it's more like do evil over and over again, you know? So I think that, you know, whatever the disparity is of what management is saying, there is a real power in the possibility of what workers are saying. And I think that could be one very uh, important step. And, <clears throat> and I think another thing that um, companies can do is allow their workforces to unionize. The fact that the Alphabet Workers Union has been one of the largest unions in the tech sector has been fighting many campaigns inside of the company, including to add caste as a protected category, shows the strength of those workers. And in fact, you know, we recently had a win in Seattle where we got Seattle, um, caste added as a protected category. Workers and unions were a key part of that. And to me, especially as I experienced this very painful you know, episode last year where I was deplatformed um, by Dominic Cass Bigots uh, when I was, you know, uh, said to speak about Dalit history. Um, Alphabet Workers Union has really stood up in that gap. Now, not only defending myself, but also Tanuja Gupta, you know, one of the Google walkout um, leaders and, you know, senior managers and worker advocates resigned and, um, and whistle blew on the whole situation. And since then, Alphabet Workers Union has been tireless on this issue of caste. And in fact, you know, um, not only are they working on this issue in Seattle, but they're working with us on other bills to change the jurisdiction where Google operates in, because when the company is not listening, they're going to actually change the law in the city or the state mm -hmm. um, in order to get workers protections because the company has not cared about um, any mm -hmm. of uh, making the workplace safer for all workers. Mm, thank you so much for making that really clear link between workers' movements, what happens inside corporations, and then what happens in cities and states. So just to reiterate for audience members who may not know, the city of Seattle just added caste as a protected category. Um, so that's a city-level decision, but as Tinmori just stated and reiterated, it was done through this massive coalition of workers, uh, labor organizers, and others. And so, in fact, these are entire ecosystems in which what is happening inside a tech company and what's happening at the city level can often uh, be moving in, in concert or working against each other. Um, but another thing I'm hearing and what you're saying is that the activist work, the, the trauma, the violence uh, is repetitive. It's, it's not something that's in the past. It's not something that happened um, in South Asia and doesn't happen in the United States. In fact, it's ubiquitous, it's interconnected. And as Dame Mori was referencing, her particular experience of being disinvited to speak at Google during Dalit History Month, to put it mildly, uh, was extremely violent and um, came with a lot of hate speech attached to it, a lot of threats. Um, and so maybe this is a really nice way for us to transition into this whole um, impulse in the book to balance, maybe is not the right word, but to integrate critique and healing. And so I wanted to ask you a little bit more about that. The book, it unfolds uh, through an Ambedkarite Buddhist practice in these four meditations. Um, it draws on indigenous theorizing to talk about caste as a soul wound. Um, could you take us a little bit into some of the method methodologies that you use in the book to move from 
trauma to healing. Um, that includes really importantly, sitting with the trauma. Um, I was wondering if you could just talk to us a little bit about some of the moves you make in the text to do that. So I think that, you know, and this is for everyone here, because I know so much of the data <clears throat> and society community is also people who are risking their lives, doing risky research to analyze and talk about the levers of power in, in the, the society that we work in <clears throat> and the tech that we use every day. But I think for me, healing was so essential in terms of how we also um, think about systems of oppression because, you know, <clears throat> I always remember going to my first dialysis center. And if anyone ever has anybody who has lost um, someone to kidney disease, kidney centers, you know, are usually like the kind of abandoned, you know, medical playgrounds of, you know, our society. Everyone that's in there is a black and brown elder. They were bus drivers, they were social workers, they were nurses. And after, you know, society has kind of squeezed out everything, you know, the end result is they're just abandoned in these centers and they're not well kept up. They're not, um, they're not properly supported. And as I sat there and, you know, was really struggling with ways to support my mom, I just saw how much we somatize the violence that we are trying to process, you know, and we carry the impacts of racial stress and caste stress and gender stress in all these different systems in our body. It's what gives us high blood pressure. It's what gives us heart attacks. It's what gives us depression and, you know, panic attacks. And certainly this conversation, you know, would be a harder conversation to have if we just hadn't all been through the pandemic. But all of us, even the most strongest, linear, logical person went through a dark night of the soul, you know, and it was a tremendous thing to carry that pain. And what I realized just in supporting my mom and also trying to keep my own boat upright as this, you know, period was going, I realized it wasn't going to be enough just to document our own demise. There had to be other pathways for understanding the problems of this. And so, you know, in my work in preparing for this book, I really was able to um, dig deep into the writings of indigenous, you know, healers and psychologists like Eduardo Duran and Maria um, Braveheart, who talk a lot about intergenerational trauma. And Eduardo Duran he really talks about this idea of the soul wound that systems of oppression take place in our bodies and our minds and our, in, in our spirits, not just in our lifetime, but that are, we carry often the pain of our lineage. And Resma Manakam takes that idea even further and talks about it in terms of the racial wound, where you know he saw bodies of privilege and bodies that are oppressed have both experiences of trauma around that soul wound, but it looks different. And that really spoke to me in terms of the issue of caste, because I think with caste oppressed people, the, the experience of caste is so tremendous because we face continual gaslighting and physical, uh, physical violence every time we talk about it. It's like, for example, for me to just do my job, I can't just be a researcher and do my work and then go to bed and call it a day. I have to do my research. I may have to plan for being in a safe house, <laughs> I might have to evacuate my parents. Um, there are attempts to like link me to terrorism and all sorts of demeaning and disgusting and terrible things that happen just because my truth as a caste oppressed person that caste exists and that we need a remedy and that we need to heal from it is too much for the bodies and the nervous systems of certain dominant caste people whose nervous systems have been wired for fragility and discomfort at the idea of sharing equity with an oppressed person. And, and I think with dominant caste people, as they start to kind of examine their own lineages, they start to see where they see their training has come around complicity, around shame, around what happens when you speak out and how you might also be taken out of your networks of privilege if you challenge the order of privilege. So there's so much that's embedded within this soul wound and you need many different kinds of leadership models to help people become free of it. You know, you need to have the logical training and the historical training so you know where caste came from and what has happened and that continuity of work. But you also need tools like mindfulness so that you can have better awareness of when your nervous system is kicking in 
and bringing in some of your su survival um, nervous system training around an experience of caste or racial stress, and then also tools to de-escalate for you to be able to have a little bit more detachment around um, what you're experiencing in order to create greater resilience so that we can have shared conversations across the privileged and the oppressed. And, and I know that sounds like a lot of scaffolding, right? Because in the academic arena, we're just like, here's the ideas, boom, let me walk away. But that doesn't really get to the fact that we're in a point of contestation of shared consensus. So a fact isn't just because of fact and evidence, which is what you're trained in in academia. A fact is an evidence also because of power. And what we've seen is despite us having enormous evidence, beside us having scholarly consensus, the right just doesn't care whether it's dominant caste bigots or white nationalists. They're like, we know it's your facts, we don't care. We prefer our alternative reality because that makes us feel better. <laughs> our nervous systems aren't challenged. And it's why you have, you know, parents in Tennessee who are trying to push, you know, school board resolutions and laws that say that they don't want slavery taught because they don't want white children to feel traumatized. And so I think that this lens of the psychosocial is a really important one for us to both interrogate and develop a praxis around, because in many ways, we are tasked with rebuilding consensus around the scholarship and work that we do. And we've had to do a lot of that work with caste equity because, um, despite you know, caste oppressed people having some of the highest rates of discrimination and, and hate crimes, um, there are still bigots who still want to deny our reality. And, and in many ways, like I think that it would be a lot easier. And social media promotes polarization for us to say, we're not going to deal with our oppressors. We got to go over here because we just it's just too much to deal with them. But when it comes to genocide, when it comes to mass atrocity, which is the, the boiling point that our homelands are in, if we don't learn new techniques for de-escalation, the alternative is that we have to pick up the debris of the aftermath and work through the corpses and work through the destruction of society. And that's a tremendously harmful and life altering thing, not just for our generation, but for the generation that comes afterwards that has to make meaning of that. So I'm not saying, you know, sit down with your oppressor, you know, cavalierly. In fact, you know, it's, it, you know, I had this insane experience, Sarita, where I sat down, I gave a, one of my first book talks, one of my biggest trolls came up to me and said they wanted to have a one-on-one -on -one meeting. And I don't know if anybody has ever had that experience. It's like sitting in front of a bully, except in this case, this bully was a billionaire. They were a venture capitalist that funds like the you know many many Indian startups, and um, and she um, has asked me to be investigated by the FBI, <laughs> and has said that she wants to litigate against us. But the thing that was amazing was I had my friends, I had physical security that was armed, and and her you know she sat down and she's like you know the more I just want to know do you really think that there's cast in tech because really, you know, I know the technologist there and everybody there is someone of merit. And I said, you know, we can talk about all of that. But what I want to get to first is why do you think it's okay for you to threaten and harm and gaslight Dalits that speak about their legitimate experiences of caste discrimination? And what she did is she stood up and then she started to say, how dare you threaten me? How dare you threaten me? And then she, she just got more and more and more escalated. And I said, let's just slow it down. We're having a conversation, but I wanna ask this because we can't even have the conversation about consensus because you won't even allow me to speak. And then she immediately ran away. And what that told me is that so many of the trolls, so many of the violent people that target researchers that are doing risky research and that are bringing truth in this moment, um, they are terrified to meet the people that they oppose in real life. They know that they actually don't have uh, factual evidence on their side and they're being driven from a place of irrationality. And so facts aren't going to move the irrational. Networks of trust do. 
you know, and that's why I'm saying that we have to have these other tools of racial healing and caste healing and reconciliation and have people who are in their networks de-escalate them. Uh, because if we don't do that, we're going to get to a more polarized, you know, and the conditions for mass atrocity will be set. Thank you. That that is a very alarming but indicative story of, of some of the things precisely that you're talking about around um, people who have had to pass um, in a caste oppressive context. And when they do step forward and begin to tell their stories, there's a tremendous amount of, of misinformation, frankly, disinformation campaigning to discredit them. Um, and I was wondering, you know, I think for this group in particular, and this is probably going to be my last question so that we can open it up to the audience and maybe I can ask a few more in there, but the chat's been really lively, so I want to open it up. But I was wondering if you had any thoughts on the recent wave of layoffs around tech that we've been seeing. How does cast play out in those layoffs, but also uh, returning to this theme of slowing things down? Is there a way we can approach the layoffs with this ethic of love um, and, and building a new consensus? Is that an opportunity? <clears throat> Well, I think the tech layoffs are devastating. And, you know, so many of the workers that they're laying off are H-1B workers. And, you know, disproportionately, many of H many of cast oppressed workers are H-1B workers. So it is a time of deep terror, I think, for our community, because it means that people may not just lose their job, but they might lose their immigration status. So I think that this is really a time to, again, center in worker organizing because management is, you know, clearly has planned these layoffs for many months. Some of these uh, departments are departments that didn't even know that they were on the chopping block and they're idiosyncratically being laid off without a lot of notice. So I think that, um, you know, my hope is, is that you know, in the wake of seeing what management is doing, that we empower workers to further create better structures of safety across all of the different pipelines of workers, because it's not just about full-time employees, it's, it's about contractors, it's about service workers. And if there can be, you know, organizing across all of these different types of um, professions, um, I think there's a real potential to be able to move, um, you know, management. And, and you see like the tragedy of what's happening at a company like Twitter in the hands of someone like Elon Musk, who doesn't care about anything and is, um, uh, but I also think that there are real worker wins that are moving where companies, you know, again, workers are changing the jurisdictions of the companies. Uh, where their companies work in in order to create safety. So I would say, you know, we've got to allow folks to find more maneuverability and, and also find um, options to kind of also find alliances with other, other worker organizing across um, the sector. So, for example, you know, a group that we, we both know, you know, Tech Workers for Cast Equity, they forged a relationship with the Asian Pacific arm of the AFL-CIO. And having that flanking support from other Asian American workers really makes it, not, it's not like what's happening to tech workers is separate from other workers in other spaces. And so that cross um, sectoral solidarity is really critical at this time. Thank you. That's that's wonderful. I'm going to take some questions um, from the Q and A, but there are also some questions into in the chat that um, that I'm going to try to pull from as well. There's a question earlier on in the chat from Edward, who was wanting to hear a little bit from you about the differences you see in how first-generation Dalit immigrants view caste and how second or third-generation Dalits in the U.S. view caste. So I think that this is a really interesting question because, um, you know, it's not like, I don't see like 
immigration kind of like on individual tracks. I think of immigration as iterative and layered, you know, almost, you know, and you're gonna laugh at me, Sarita, like a parata, a really nicely layered parata, right? The layers, if they work really well, like in a croissant, you can't, they all start to like mix together, right? So I think in that same context, you know, certainly I was a second generation Dalit, like I was born in the United States in East LA. And, um, and my experience of caste was, you know, in the first like 20 years of my life was based here in the United States. And I saw um, caste like in the American institutions I was in. So I, you know, I was bullied in K through 12. I had parents of upper caste children practice untouchability, like didn't want to like eat on the same plates that I was eating on. I had discrimination in university housing where, you know, people didn't want to share space with someone who ate meat, you know, for example, or cooked meat in the house. Um, but I also, and I had people who used open slurs and were denigratory once I came out as a Dalit. And then I faced even more serious things in terms of rape threats and death threats. So a lot of gener you know, second generation Dalits like myself, um, their parents may or may not have shared with them their full caste identity. I think the trauma piece is so heavy for my parents' generation. And there was no rule book about how to be a Dalit abroad. You know, the, the basic rule book that they had was let's get out of this violent system. And I think like all traumatized people, they were like, and let's shove that trauma as deep as we can into the closet and never talk about it. Because this, you know, they, they were trying to buy into the American dream where it's like, I can just come here, I'll make my life, I'll be a doctor, I'll be a lawyer, whatever it is. And if I just close my eyes and think really hard, maybe the intergenerational trauma will not be present. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't work like that, you know, and I think what was really interesting for my parents is that even though they never wanted to say the word caste and they didn't want me to know that we were Dalit, it was there all around them in the behaviors for them because they were still terrified and they were still traumatized. Mm -hmm. And so they had insomnia, they had panic attacks, they were afraid of sharing their history, so they lived in the closet. And if you're a child who is watching your parents hide their identity because of the fear of being outed, you know that something's wrong, you know? So it's certainly there, you know, for us as second generation Dalits, but for people who immigrate here and maybe here as H1B visa holders or people who, um, you know, did their education and stuff in India, caste is really present for them as well because they're moving into industries that are often very casteist. So they have to hide their identity. They have to be concerned about if they speak about their activism, could they lose their job? Could they face an HR complaint? And that's happened to Dalit workers is that when they've advocated for caste equity or like to post, they've been called in and written up by their managers saying this is not appropriate for the work. Mm -hmm. um, and these are unlawful things that are happening, but it's happening. So I think what ends up happening across the generational divide is that people are trying to figure out how little can they say and how much pain can they avoid without actually confronting it. And mm -hmm. I think, again, that's one of the reasons why I wanted to write the book was to say, it's actually okay. It's okay for us to be honest about how bad things are. It's okay for us to have grief about our experience. And it's also okay for us to ask for the right to heal. Mm -hmm. And I think all of those things um, have been tremendous openers, not just for the Dalit community, but for the broader South Asian community and for other allied movements who are learning about caste, have been seeing caste manifest in their institution the book really opens up shared language for us to build, you know, very powerful shared um, internationalisms. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, another question from Sabu is, you noted that casteist speech has already become the norm at social media firms. How might they reverse this given the added caste as a protected category with your interventions? Well, one of the things that we have to do is like we actually prepare slur list documents, you know, because you'll be surprised. Um, many of these companies don't have active slur lists related to um, caste slurs or religious slurs. 
Um, so we had to provide that for these companies and then also provide translation across all of the different languages that a slur might operate in. Because again, many of these companies didn't even translate their moderation guidelines into local languages. So I remember one of my first hilarious engagements with Facebook was I was like, your community guidelines are not even offered in many Indian languages. And they were like, yeah, we had basically tried to crowdsource the translation. And I said, why don't you just reassign the money that you have for your cereal bar to get professional translation? <laughs> because why on earth are you asking for a volunteer yeah. to translate something that creates liability, but is actually there for their user safety? But that's that's what I'm saying. There was such like an abject failure of duty of care when it came to the safety of brown bodies using their tools. And then the ways that they were trying to approach it was just so, you know, just lacked competency, we can just say. So I think that there are practical things you can do, like provide slur lists, give them context, and then they'll use them to put into their AI classifiers and all of that. But the bottom line is, is that even when you engage with them in that, they're still not taking down the majority of hate speech because hate speech is their big profit maker, especially for Twitter and Instagram and Facebook. They make money every time dangerous speech is happening. Because to be honest, you can't solve this on a slur by slur level. You actually have to have a policy for mass atrocity for a country. And they have to say, we know that this is a tier one dangerous country. It's really unsafe for us to operate, which Facebook has said. I don't know if you guys remember in that that Wall Street report um, that occurred, but they said that um, we are not moderating certain content from dangerous actors because we cannot ensure the safety of our staff and our offices. So if a company can't even you know, ensure that, how can they ensure the safety of its users? Like we are so far beyond the realm of solving this through just one-on-one -on -one advocacy, a huge structural intervention needs to occur and an acknowledgement from these companies that they are working in democratic contexts that are in crisis and which mass atrocity is imminent. So that should require a different duty of care, a different layer of transparency, uh, but they're making money. And they'll probably make money as long as they can uh, because brown and black life is very cheap to them. Thank you. Uh, I, we have just a few more minutes for questions. So I'll try to get in a few more. Um, there's a question from Michael about large language models. And the question is more or less that these language models continue the ideological violence work of cultural genocide and white supremacy, what can we do about it? Is there a solution in terms of limiting our tech engagement to, the, to a bare minimum or something else? So I think that it's, you know, this is very much, I think, similar to the question around abolition. You know, when people are like, no more jails or no more police, people are like, well, what does that mean? Like, does that mean all of a sudden, like, everything will be unsafe? And I think we have to realize it took us a long time to get here, and it's going to take a long time for us to envision the alternative. And that's why I wrote a lot about the just transition in my book, because I think that the model and the frameworks of just transition are a pathway for us to think about um, the ways that we get to building that, that new kind of institutional model for how we might want to engage with technology, I think begins with small and large experiments. Experiments that look at changes of the business model, that look at changes of kind of management and worker power. Experiments that look at ways that we can actually address um, equity in a foundational way versus in a superficial transactional way, right? But if you try to do all those things all at the same time with no capital, um, it's not going to move, you know? That's why I think what you do is you just say, we want to commit to the just transition. We know that we need to get here. We don't know the path, but we're going to start seeking investment for us to experiment towards that. And, and I think this is where we stop being firefighters and documenters of our own demise and become architects of the future that we want. Mm -hmm. And that requires also a shift of vision, you know, because I think so much of, I think when we see these like billionaire capitalists that are doing these, you know, companies, when you actually get under the surface of all the, you know, flash and boomba of their saying, there isn't really a lot, there's no there there, you know, 
all you have to see is like what Elon Musk is doing with Twitter to just realize there is no there there, you know. Um, but I don't think we empower ourselves enough to step into that architect's role. But, uh, but I think that a lot of that also has to do with the fact that we haven't fully healed. I think many of us feel that w the only thing that's possible is rapid response. And so part of the invitation in my book is to say, we can have all the things. We can have all the things. We don't need a seat at the table. We can say, fuck it. We want our own table. And this is what it looks like at our table, you know? And, and to, to be that ambitious, really also requires your heart to be expansive and open and alive with possibilities. And when you're burnt out and when you're exhausted and when you're, you're struggling with depression or physical illness, it's harder to feel that sense of expansiveness. And I think that's why mutual care, mutual aid, and an understanding that many of us are in so many different places um, post COVID, um, even though we're not in a post-COVID moment, you know, many of us have survived COVID and we are changed people. We are a changed species. What are we going to do with that knowledge? Mm. And I think we have so much more that we can do with that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I'm sneaking in one final question, which combines two questions. Is that I think you're really starting to answer this question from Irene, which is how do we stop ourselves from passing down these soul wounds to future generations? How can we instead pass down our heal resilient souls? And then another very practical question, which is for folks who are not from CU, who are not from a South Asian cultural background, how can we recognize caste discrimination? And what do we mean when we say caste language is already the, or casteist language is already a norm in tech? So I think, you know, how we stop passing on the soul wounds, whether they're racial or caste or, um, you know, settler colonial in nature, I think really comes from us situating and doing our own work. I think many times we want to solve the problem and fix other people or fix the system as mm -hmm. wounded healers you know, but where we haven't really done our own work and which means that we sometimes cause harm because we haven't done that work. So I think that it really requires us to first sit, understand your lineage, understand the pain that lies within it. And, and this isn't just a process of logic. It's not like I was a refugee and I experienced this thing and this thing and this thing or whatever the story of pain is that you have. It's not just about writing it and thinking about it. You've got to find where it lives in your body and you've got to move it. You've got to think about what would help you kind of create a container for it. Sometimes it's grief and being witnessed by a therapist. Sometimes it might be ceremony, you know, with other trusted people. Maybe it might be a collective group that is made up of other similar survivors of whatever the issue is in your lineage. But being able to focus on that, to integrate that experience, to build yourself into an integrated place of consciousness, that helps you then be a little bit more mindful in how you react to the repetitive stress that comes from that system of oppression. Because the thing about why I wrote so deeply about mindfulness in my book and use the model that Ruth King shared around mindfulness of race is that part of what we wanna do when we're starting to apply tools from mindfulness to address our experiences of caste and racial stress is that instead of us experiencing a trigger and then immediately going to action, which oftentimes goes to our default programming of survival and is oftentimes harmful for us, we're inserting new steps that allow us to have reflection about what's going on in our body, the consideration of our lineage and how it contributes to what we wanna do. And instead of us even thinking about action, we're thinking about nurture. How can I be nurtured from this point of stress? And that's a very different thing because usually when something chaotic or traumatic happens, our first thing is like, hold my earrings, I am ready to go, <laughs> you know? But not everything requires a fight. Not everything requ requires an engagement um, of, of conflict. It might just be that you need to talk to someone who witnesses you. Or, or and, I, and I say this also to many BIPOC people, because if you are in 
white majority workforces or for caste suppressed people or in dominant caste workforces, you often feel because you're the diversity hire that it's your job to change the work culture when in fact that's not your job at all. Your job, unless it's said in your job description, I am the DEI representative that is responsible for all of the things that are going wrong in the organization, which I have never seen in a job description and I'm sure it would be highly illegal, but who cares? You know, then I think this is a place where mindfulness can be so helpful because we can make choices. We can say, this is my responsibility and this is not. Mm -hmm. you know? And do I have capacity in the container to do this or do I not? And that was really helpful for me because part of my burnout was that I would say yes to every emergency because I felt like the one instance I would say no could lead to greater tragedy. But being able to be more thoughtful about my own experiences of wounding and healing and integrating that knowledge made me a more effective organizer, made me a more thoughtful theorist, and also helped me situate um, the ways that I want to build power more authentically. And I'm going to end us there, although I know you have so much more to share with us and so much more wisdom for us. But please, everybody, join me in thanking Tain Mori Sandarajan for her time today. It was an amazing conversation. And you can pick up your copy of The Trauma of Cast at your favorite bookseller. Thank you so much. And good afternoon, everybody. Oh, wait, Sarita, before yes. you go, I was just going to say, so yes, thank you for all the love. And I also wanted to say um, two other things. One was, Irene, for you in particular, there's a lot of work around intergenerational trauma and the Korean context with that idea of Han, H-A-N. Mm -hmm. And I think that's really a beaut that really inspired me because it was about in order for you to free yourself, you have to free your lineage's pain. So I, I really recommend you do that work there and look at that. But also I wanted to ask people to follow us on Equality Labs and tune in tomorrow at 11 a.m. Pacific Standard Time for an IG Live. We have a very special announcement about one of a very, very big next step in terms of caste equity. And um, I can't tell you, I can't tell you all the secrets, but I will tell you that it does involve a statewide bill for adding caste as a protected category, but I cannot tell you which state because you must tune in tomorrow at 11 a.m. And we'll have lots of actions that we want you to follow up on. So Sarita, sorry to take that little extra bit, but hello, it was a big big scoop I was giving to data and society. Huge scoop. Thank you for the scoop. And thank you for ending on such a beautiful cliffhanger. Can't wait till tomorrow. <laughs> Bye, everybody. Jay Beam and Jay Savitri, everyone. Bye. Bye. Bye.